the work that uh, people do in our department. And so you'll, you'll have a high level view today of epidemiology and biostatistics. So let's go ahead and start with what epidemiology is. Um, given that this is National Public Health Week, I do think it's important to point out that epidemiology is one of the cornerstones of public health and really serves an important foundation for everything that we do in, in public health. So epidemiology is a data-driven quantitative discipline that uses very specific and rigorous methods to collect, analyze, and interpret health-related data in human populations. What makes epidemiology different from, for example, medicine, is that in epidemiology, we focus on populations, so groups of people, rather than on individual patients. And so epidemiology really focuses on groups of individuals that we refer to as populations. So as part of our work, our goal is to describe, understand, and reduce disease in human populations. To do that, we identify factors that increase risk of disease. Uh, we develop and we evaluate interventions to reduce and prevent disease. So sometimes people refer to epidemiologists as disease detectives, because a lot of the work that we do focuses on trying to get a handle on, um, in terms of what's going on. So for example, we monitor the health of populations. We identify differences between populations in terms of rates of disease um, and also health-related events. We also work to identify what those factors are that either are associated with increased risk of, of disease or health outcomes or actually are protective. We shape policy using this data and information. We contribute to evidence-based practices, and we also implement and evaluate interventions to improve population health. So just some examples of things that epidemiologists and our work um, helps to inform are things like cholesterol screening, blood pressure screening, mammograms. Again, you know, doing the research to help inform those types of practices falls under the purview of epidemiology. So biostatistics, uh, which is closely related to epidemiology, a very complementary discipline, is also a quantitative discipline. And biostatistics is a branch of statistics that focuses on understanding biological phenomenon through the use of statistical modeling and methodologies. So biostatisticians develop and apply statistical techniques to health-related research. Biostatistics is also a uh, core public health discipline, and as I said, is very complementary to epidemiology. So our department, which is the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, includes expertise in both of these disciplines. In terms of the mission of our department, our mission is to improve population health through research, education, community engagement, and translation of discoveries into practice. So in terms of the work that we do as epidemiologists, um, we engage in research to understand environmental, social, dietary, genetic determinants of health, as well as how those factors interact with each other and how those factors all shape health and also health disparities. So some of the uh, conditions that we work on in our department, aging, aging and cognition, cancer, chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And so you can see that our, our research goes far beyond thinking about COVID. Uh, we focus on many, many conditions that impact populations and population health. Our work also encompasses many different populations. For example, some of our faculty work on projects that uh, focus on conditions in children or adolescents and young adults, as well as adults, and even the oldest old, so people over the age of 90. Uh, we also focus on diverse populations. So any, basically our, our research and our scholarly activity is far reaching and does not just uh, focus on or end with COVID although that certainly falls under our purview. So I did wanna take some time to highlight uh, some of the work in our department conducted by our faculty. And as I said, we have expertise in a number of areas, um, both in terms of conditions, but also in terms of the types of factors that we look at. So I'll, I'll just give you a sense of what the faculty do in our department. Um, I'll say both pre and post COVID, that this work has continued throughout the pandemic and will continue uh, well beyond that. 
So we do have a lot of expertise in our department in cancer. Uh, we have a number of faculty working on cancer-related projects. And the first is uh, Dr. Sora Park Pantasiri, who I know is here with our seminar class today. So um, because epidemiology, I said, is, is a cornerstone of public health, and many of the work, much of the work that we do, do um, you know, involves monitoring the health of populations. Cancer is obviously a major public health problem that we are concerned with. So Dr. Pantasiri's work focuses on looking at racial and ethnic and income disparities in cancer screening, diagnosis, and treatment. She also focuses on interventions, both developing and evaluating those interventions to try to reduce risk factors such as smoking um, in diverse populations. She also has expertise in community-based participatory research and working with a range of populations on um, a variety of different public health problems related to cancer. Dr. Tanjasiri, you also see on our title up here, holds many roles, including as the Associate Director of Cancer Health Disparities and Community Engagement in our Cancer Center. And so you can see a couple of uh, selected examples of her research in the department. In addition to Dr. Tanjasiri, uh, we also have Dr. Joel Miller, who is one of our newer recruitments to our department, also focused on cancer. But you can see that Dr. Leland's research uh, focuses on adolescents and young adults, also on survivorship, so of individuals who have had cancer and are survivors of cancer, health behavior and positive psychology. So although he focuses on cancer, his, his approach is different to that, than Dr. Kansas series, but this gives you a sense of the range of expertise that we have in our department and the range of problems that epidemiologists work on. So we're also happy to have Joel joining us. He is also um, involved in our Cancer Center, and he's the program co-leader for our Cancer Control Program. He also just received uh, funding for a new inter-institutional um, R01 funded by the National Cancer Institute. And this is a collaboration involving UCI, USC, and Chalk Children's Hospital. And this project, um, the focus is medical follow-up care of young adult aging survivors of pediatric cancers. And the goal of this project will be to increase culturally congruent outreach to improve care among survivors of childhood cancer. In addition, we have Dr. Thomas Taylor, who is a uh, biostatistician, also working on cancer. Um, his approach is a little bit different as a biostatistician. He focuses on methods and evaluating uh, clinical trials uh, for a variety of different treatments in cancer. His primary work focuses on glioblastoma, which is a brain cancer that has very poor survival. And so a lot of his work focuses on looking at different treatment options for individuals uh, with glioblastoma with the goal of increasing survival of individuals with that type of cancer. In our department is also a joint in our department is also Dr. Sun Min Lee. She is a social epidemiologist and she focuses on a variety of different conditions, um, including cancer. She also looks though at sleep disparities and cardiometabolic health, uh, cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. And her primary focus is on epidemiologic methods, including designing, implementing and evaluating culturally tailored randomized controlled trials. Her work focuses on ways to reduce health disparities, uh, especially for minority and immigrant populations. So again, special populations in, in Dr. Sunman Lee's work. She also focuses on cancer screening and prevention, and she has a, a funded project um, in stomach cancer, focusing on Chinese, Korean, and Vietnamese populations. So again, you can see even, even in the area of cancer, faculty in our department work on a range of different um, topics within the broad category of cancer. We also have expertise in our department in chronic disease. And for example, Dr. Loha Zhang, who is a biostatistician in our department, she works on a variety of different uh, types of research projects. Uh, again, applying biostatistical methods to the work of her, her projects, but also assisting everybody else uh, 
uh, with their projects, given her expertise. So Dr. Zhang also has a, a range of uh, research projects that she's working on, but some of her current projects focus on looking at dementia, um, particularly in American Indian and Alaska Native populations and elders. She also has several projects in those same populations focused on diabetes. So Dr. Zhang's work, again, uh, you can see our, our faculty that work runs the full spectrum of not only projects, but also disease areas. Dr. Odegaard in our department, also an epidemiologist, and his research interests include thinking about obesity, metabolic disorders, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease and cognition, as well as cancer. And his primary uh, focus in all of these disease areas is the role of diet um, and, and their association with disease. In particular, uh, sugar-sweetened beverages is the focus of his work. Dr. Maria Kirada also has a joint about Sali um, appointment in our department. She's an epidemiologist and her research areas really focus on the oldest old. So again, individuals 90 years old and older. And I'm sure many of you on campus are aware of the great work of she and Dr. Kowas in terms of the 90 plus study, um, a very large study of individuals 90 years of old, age and older, where they've done some tremendous work to understand aging and dementia, especially in that older population, as well as other age-related conditions. And so their work, again, you know, runs the full, the full spectrum. They focus on the, the older end of the uh, age distribution of populations. In addition, we also have faculty in our department who focus on environmental exposures. And there are a large number of environmental exposures, but for example, Dr. Rufus Edwards focuses primarily on air pollution exposures and you know, not just air pollution like smog the way that we might think about it here, but for example, in developing countries, the use of indoor cooking equipment also creates air pollution. And so his work really addresses um, air pollution on a, on a broad scale and then also thinking about policies to address air pollution globally. So he does a lot of international work, uh, focusing again on a very interesting environmental um, epidemiology problem. In addition, we also have faculty in our department whose expertise um, or research focuses on the use of genomic and genomic information. For example, Dr. Trina Norton Kritchmar. Um, in our department is a bioinformaticist. And she really straddles between epidemiology and biology in helping us to understand and interpret uh, the results of genomic information. So for example, bioinformatics applied to basic research in human disease. She works on developing new tools to assist in understanding the role of, of genetic variants in disease. She also focuses on genetic and genomic epidemiology, as well as epigenetics and the microbiome. So again, this is a field uh, that is very important in epidemiology and biostatistics in terms of helping us to translate those discoveries into practice and to understand the implications of the genetic research that we're doing. In addition, we also have Dr. Beth Thomas in our department who she also focuses on biomarkers, including genetic biomarkers for disease. Her research spans a number of different areas, including, for example, um, attention deficit hyper hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. And so her work also focuses on children and younger adults, um, looking for biomarkers that increase or associated with risk or uh, different uh, subtypes of disease in ADHD. So she also runs the, um, the uh, research lab-based component of the Institute for Interdisciplinary Salivary Bioscience Research. And in that role, she also looks for salivary biomarkers that are associated with disease. And in that case, it's a number of different diseases that they're working on, including COVID-19, for example. So her work involves trying to identify clinical biomarkers um, that can be tested through saliva, as well as 
other genomic biomarkers like epigenetics and uh, genomic biomarkers as well. Her work also involves psychiatric disorders and neurodegenerative diseases. So again, uh, most people in epidemiology work across a variety of different conditions, as well as using a variety of different techniques to try to understand what's going on with the diseases that they're interested in. And then finally, my own book, um, I'm a genetic epidemiologist, and I focus on trying to understand genetic susceptibility to a whole host of diseases. And so, for example, in my particular case, I focus more on methods as applied to a range of different conditions. So my work involves trying to understand the genetic um, influences involved in, for example, type 2 diabetes. I also work in Parkinson's disease as well as cancer. And so my main focus is trying to understand not only how our underlying genetic variation contributes to risk of disease, but also how those genetic factors interact with environmental factors, such as diet um, and a whole host of other environmental factors. My work also focuses on trying to use this genomic information to improve not only prediction of disease, but also treatment. So this is an area that frequently is referred to as precision medicine. I would also refer to it as precision public health. So trying to use genomic and other information to identify those at risk for disease, and then to also use that information to develop interventions that would help reduce risk of disease or improve health. I also have an interest in thinking about the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomic research. We want to make sure, for example, that identifying genetic variants or other genetic markers that we don't inadvertently or purposefully use that information to discriminate against people. And so the field of public health genetics really focuses on thinking about the ethical, legal, and social implications of that work and how we translate it appropriately into practice, both clinical and public health practice. So that also is a very exciting area of public health. So I've kind of talked quickly here, so I'm going to go to my next few slides and then hopefully we will have some time for discussion and um, opportunities for questions. So I guess I'll start out with my question, what does an epidemiologist do post-COVID? And basically I would say we continue to focus on improving the health of populations using both epidemiological and biostatistical approaches to um, monitor, understand and intervene at the population level to improve health. So I'd like to thank everybody for helping us to celebrate National Public Health Week. It's exciting as an epidemiologist to talk to everybody and um, have everybody become a little bit more familiar with the work that we do in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. And um, that was a pretty quick talk. So I'm happy to answer any questions or have more discussion about what, what epidemiologists and also biostatisticians do and how we contribute to population health. So I'll stop sharing my slides and that way I can see the chat a little bit better. Hi, Karen, I've got a question. Great. From an, epidemiolo an epidemiologist's perspective, um, to what extent did the pandemic divert resources away from public health efforts? And how did epidemiology as a discipline adapt to that change? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, you know, I think most, many epidemiologists pivoted and, you know, focused on, for example, thinking about COVID and the response that was needed for that. So I can say personally for me, um, you know, even though, as you can see from my, my research slide, most of my research focuses on genetic susceptibility, you know, as an epidemiologist, I pivoted, you know, to start answering questions for the general population and others, just in terms of, I'll say basic epidemiologic concepts that are important for conveying information about how we need to respond um, in, in, in COVID-19 and the pandemic. So for me personally, I, you know, I had to pivot and start doing a lot more, um, I'll say outreach and education, which I think is you know, a professional responsibility that epidemiologists have 
during this pandemic was to make sure that correct information was conveyed and people understood what was going on. In terms of resources and diverting those resources, you know, on the one hand, I think resources were targeted towards, you know, the pandemic and the, the needs that were required to combat that, um, you know, the situation. I would say in general, the problem with public health is, is it tends to be underfunded. And this has historically been the case that, um, you know, the public health infrastructure and activities of public health, including epidemiologists working in local, state, and federal public health agencies, resources have been low. I mean, I hope as a result of the pandemic that people will now recognize how important public health is and that perhaps we have an opportunity now to enhance our public health infrastructure as a result of this pandemic. So I think that we'll, we will have to see how that, how that turns out. Great, thank you. Karen, I have a quick question. Um, can you kind of go in a little bit deeper into kind of the connection between epidemiology and the study of epidemiology and, and cancer? Sure. Um, so, you know, there, as you can see from the, the slides that I showed, there are a variety of different ways that epidemiology contributes to, I will say, the field of, of cancer. So, for example, you know, understanding, we'll start at the basic level, understanding what factors increase, for example, risk of cancer or are protective. So, for example, diet, um, exercise, physical activity. So, epidemiologists try to, uh, try to identify what factors um, either increase or decrease risk of disease. Identifying those factors then provides us opportunities to develop intervention. So, smoking. For example, you know, through a number of epidemiologic studies, we identified smoking, cigarette smoking, as a risk factor, for example, for lung cancer many, many years ago. And so it was epidemiologic studies that identified cancer, or sorry, identified smoking as a risk factor for cancer. Knowing that that then is a risk factor for cancer, you can see many opportunities for, you know, I'll say then downstream types of applications. And um, so, for example, smoking cessation programs and public health campaigns to reduce smoking, those are a result of you know, the early epidemiologic studies that identified smoking as a risk factor. But then also the interventions, developing those interventions for communities, um, tailoring those interventions for particular populations, the public health campaigns to reduce smoking, and increase awareness that smoking is associated with cancer, as well as then policies um, you know, about smoking, for example, not smoking indoors. These are all policies that are the result of many of the epidemiologic studies. So that whole spectrum I just described falls under epidemiology. And so you can see epidemiologists work at all of these different levels of um, you know, understanding a problem all the way through developing policies that will help protect the population. And, you know, there's many more examples. That's, that's a pretty uh, high level overview of how epidemiology contributes to understanding cancer. And as I said, we've got several faculty in our department who work at these different um, stages of, of understanding cancer and preventing, for example. Thank you. Great question. I, I think that, you know, hopefully what people will walk away with after, after this seminar is that epidemiology, you know, is pretty broad in terms of the types of problems we work on and, you know, at what level uh, we, we contribute to the knowledge base around a particular disease or health condition. Nina, did you want to ask your question? Yeah. yeah, I've got another one. It's a follow up to my earlier question and yours actually. Um, Dr. Edwards, you mentioned preventable diseases. I'm just wondering if you've seen, well, if it's true that the pandemic diverted resources away from public health and away from epidemiology um, and that the public health is generally underfunded, um, have you seen any trends 
in the distribution or frequency of preventable diseases that suggest maybe we've lost some of the progress we've made due to the pandemic? Well, there is one big one, and that is on lifespan. I mean, this will probably be the first time in, in many years in this country that our lifespan um, as a population has been impacted by the pandemic. I think the other ways that you know the pandemic has influenced health, for example, is we, we believe, and I'm sure we will be seeing more data to support this as time goes on, that people reduce their, what, what they consider to be, um, you know, not mandatory, but, you know, reduce going to physicians, for example, and doing a regular screening. So, for example, we know that people reduce their screenings of all types of things um, by not going in to see their physicians. We also are concerned that for many diseases without, because people um, weren't seeking regular, regular medical care and, you know, their annual appointments, that we may see an increase for example, I'll, I'll go back to cancer, an increase in diagnosis of cancer at later stages because people were not undergoing the screening as they normally would prior to the pandemic. So for example, if people stop going into mammograms or cholesterol screenings, once people start back up with their regular health exams and screening, unfortunately, we may see a number of cases that are diagnosed at a later stage than they would have been. This is the importance of screening, is that we identify and we catch cases of disease earlier on in the course, because intervention generally is um, more helpful the earlier we catch disease. And so this is why screening is so important for a number of different conditions. And with the pandemic, you know, we, we, we suspect, and there is data to support this, that people did not engage in the regular annual screenings, um, as frequently, they may have delayed going to the doctor, even though they were having symptoms, for example. And so I do think we will see the impacts of this going forward, not only in cancer, but in a number of other conditions. Thank you. It looks like we've got a question in the chat from Amanda. Let's see. What are some areas, some of areas that public health is focused on and will focus on in our local communities? Well, that's a great one, Amanda. Um, you know, we have a lot of activity focused on, for example, cancer. And Dr. Kansas' work is a, a great example of that, as well as Dr. Um, so I, I would say there is a lot of effort on cancer in our local communities. Um, many of the studies that we were conducting that we're conducting in our department that were listed on the slides include individuals from our local communities. So for example, diabetes, um, stroke, cardiovascular disease. Some of the dietary interventions that Dr. Odegaard is working on are working um, with participants from our, our local communities. So I would say much of the work that we do in epidemiology focuses on the local communities. But certainly there's a lot of um, outreach and engagement of local communities um, focused on cancer because of the role of the cancer center, as well as because of the number of faculty in our department working in that area. You're welcome. It's like, Lisa has a question. Yeah, uh, I'm not an epidemiologist, but one of the observations that I've seen during this, the last two years is how much information was shared to everybody which my understanding came from a lot of the uh, information that our biostatisticians and epidemiologists were able to produce. At the same time, it's a lot of information, but there seemed to have been a gap in the way this was understood by, by the regular Joe, you know, the regular person. Mm -hmm. And um, I've wondered about too much information being too much and which begs the question, do we also need to train our people on how to talk about data in this manner, in an ethical way? I mean, what is what 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 is the training we can provide um, the experts in this regard when it comes to disseminating information? Yeah, now, I think that's a great a great question, Lisa. I mean, being able to commu communicate information um, is really important, and we know that 
literacy, and I'm not just talking about, you know, I'm, I'm talking about numerical literacy, for example, being able to understand and interpret graphs and charts and figures is, is something that, you know, is really important to the population. And so for us as epidemiologists and for the students in our programs, not only in epidemiology, but in all of our public health disciplines, being able to communicate complex information in a way that people can understand it is really important. And, you know, I, I will say that doing media interviews, you know, is a, a whole nother level because frequently you're trying to convey complex information in a way that people can understand it. And, you know, sometimes that information is miscommunicated um, through the medium. So I think, you know, training, training all of us and all of us getting practice in trying to communicate to, I'll say more general audiences is really important. And I think especially for our students, it's a skill that we all have to have um, when we get out there. It, it doesn't do much good to just produce the material if we can't effectively utilize that information to make positive changes. So communication about risk and other, other topics that are you know, a little more complex is an important skill for all of us to have. Thank you. Okay, does anyone have any other questions before we close? Okay, not, not seeing anyone. Okay, great. Well, um, Karen, any closing words before we sign off? No, I just want to thank everybody for coming today. And as I said, helping us to celebrate National Public Health Week and um, hope, hope the rest of the seminars this week are, are helpful to everybody. And um, hopefully we are post-COVID or coming into the post-COVID era, but again, uh, you know, there, there is still COVID out there, and I just urge everybody to, you know, pay attention and continue to be cautious. Um, hopefully we will, we will be through this soon. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Edwards, for joining us. And I wanted to mention that uh, all of the recordings will be uh, distributed in our campus newsletter uh, in case you want to see this again. All right. Thank, thank you so much, everyone. Have a nice afternoon.